Welcome, I'm Tony Policiati, lead architect for Crosstown Concourse. As you may know, Crosstown Concourse was honored as one of three 2018 Dree House Award winners. For those that don't know the story, Crosstown Concourse is the 1.5 million square foot behemoth in the background. It began as a Sears distribution center in 1927 and was largely abandoned by 1983. Predictably, as the employment base dwindled, the surrounding community died. We created this graphic to help understand the enormous scale. Stood on its end, Crosstown would be taller than the Chrysler Building in New York. Crosstown is in fact 30,000 square feet larger than the Chrysler Building. Beyond size, the physical condition was quite daunting. One of the beauties of Crosstown Concourse is the richness of the story. Please watch this powerful excerpt from a documentary that lives on the Crosstown Concourse website. I want to see it come back. Whatever it takes to bring it back, put some more life in this building. And I think it will do the community a whole lot of good, sure thing. I mean, it might bring outside people in here to do some work, some business. Yeah, I don't think it should be left like this. It's just too good. You know, and I look around at town when I go around all these empty buildings you could build some of that thing put all them people in this building to produce and make money yep and it's a good structure it's stout it sure is you can put anything in here yep I hate to see it like this kind of hurting mm-hmm Back in 1926, Sears wanted to open a distribution center in Memphis. They come scout around, do it very, very quietly, and they look into the Crosstown neighborhood. So in 1927, 2,000 men worked 24 hours a day, only stopping from midnight on Saturday to midnight on Sunday. The building was completed and operational in 180 days. That's almost unheard of. The original building was more than 650,000 square feet. The building included the retail store, the catalog distribution plant for like seven states. Sears at that time was a major catalog store. And to be able to have a distribution center here meant if you were living in Arkansas or Louisiana or Alabama, you took the Sears wish book and you filled out the form and you mailed it in, you were going to get your products that much quicker. I mean, it's a major economic development for the city. My first day in this building, just before going to the first grade, my mother brought me down here from the Greg School area on a streetcar and we bought blue jeans. I'll never forget the smells in the building. They had a candy shop, peanuts and pecans. Remember, when I first came here, Sears was probably the largest single employee in the city. We were the FedEx of Memphis at that time. This is where I met my wife. <laughs> right here at this cash register. There were always a lot of activities going on in the plant. A lot of the employees got together. We would have skits. We would have programs on July the 4th. We had contests. They called all the managers and all the supervisors up to the 11th floor. Our general manager walked in, he read a letter to us that they were closed, that Sears was closing catalog. And to the people with families, or even if you weren't ready to retire, this was devastating news. There were people that loved this property, loved this structure. People would stop me if they see me out in the yard cutting the grass and they'd say, can you take me in there? I want to see that place. My grandfather worked there. It was just a big, empty place. And so one day I saw some young men, they were walking around and looking over the building across the church. I went across and introduced myself. Are you trying to do something here? And Chris Mann called me and said, yes, sir. We are here, we're trying to do a feasibility study for that building. So basically the conversation started out with, wouldn't it be cool if? And it was purchased purely for a civic, with a civic vision. No, no developer in their right mind would, would, would purchase this building. <laughs> we 
put together a development team and we started off with a year-long feasibility study that really looked at can anything happen with this building and if so what. At the core of that was the arts, music, visual arts, performing arts, multidisciplinary. We also started Crosstown Arts, a nonprofit that was to facilitate the conversation but at the same time begin to have events in the building, in the neighborhood, to bring people back to Crosstown. It was an initial effort about renovating a building, but it was also about building community. Anyone who had real experience doing this would have just said it's a completely ridiculous idea. That the building's too big and everyone involved that had anything to do with the project on any level, they all share a little of that Memphis style of hardcore believing in something regardless of how crazy it might seem on the surface. In the initial introduction to the building, I think the emotion that that sparked, the moment that Frank, he unlocked the door and you walk in, just a sensation of awe at the magnitude and scale scope of this building. By the end of the first year, we didn't have the words to apply vertical urban village. The only thing that we could say is beyond mixed use. And so it was less about simply retail and office and residential coexisting like a traditional mixed use approach, but it was more about recruiting tenants who actually wanted to be next to each other. We did a back of the envelope and realized this can happen if these things work out, and there was a list of about 25 of them, then the project will happen. If any one of those things didn't work out, then the project won't happen, but there was a pathway forward. With the organizations that we had, and Scott Morris has also a third party advocate for the project. If we started in 2009, it was August of 2012 that we first officially announced to the public what we were up to. I'll be very, probably too honest. When I was first approached with this opportunity, I was like, it's a great deal, it's good for the city, <laughs> this is going to be a humongous task to be a native Memphian. I didn't want to be the one who stood in the way of this project getting done. And that's why I jumped on board real early and with one meeting I said, we're going to see what we can do. This is one of the biggest projects I've ever been on. I see the character they leaving in the building. There's a movement going on. Instead of tearing down some of your valuable properties, the building can be saved. I think you can bring it back and keep character in Memphis. One of the most memorable moments in my life was when all 32 sources of financing, the attorneys for each of those different groups, sent out an email that said, we are ready to close. And it all happened within about 45 seconds. As a young developer, understanding the power of inclusion and diversity and how that really impacts a product and the results of something being right, that's instrumental. They were updating me periodically and they say there are some things we're working on and hopefully we're going to present them to our group and see what they will think of. And so when finally they say that there is a viable group that is going to pick up this building and willing to invest in it, I really, I, I shouted, I go, hallelujah. And I'll never forget, we were riding on the bus, we were bringing kids back to school, bringing them back home, and one of the younger ones comes up and he sits next to me, and he's looking at the building and he says, Miss Jazzy, are we moving in that building? And I said, yeah, in a couple of months we're going to move in that building. And he said, Miss Jazzy, does that building kind of, sort of belong to us? And I looked over and I could see that sign, yours slash ours, down the side of the building. And truthfully, I was able to answer, yeah, it belongs to us. This is Crosstown Concourse after eight years of visioning, design, and construction. Note the yours sign on the garage. You might have picked up on the community focus in the video. This sign is an art installation that alludes to the iconic Sears signage that used to be on the garage and proudly proclaims the mission of community. 
Within a year of its 2017 opening, Crosstown proudly hosted the 50th commemoration of Martin Luther King's life. As a lifelong Memphian, this was a significant moment, not just for Crosstown, but as a beacon to the world of just how far Memphis has come. Through very intentional outreach, design, and programming, Crosstown opened 98.7% occupied. Clearly, that's a business success. But more importantly, Crosstown opened as a place for everyone, regardless of race, religion, age, or socioeconomic status. In the video, Todd Richardson, one of the primary visionaries behind Crosstown said, success is not the groundbreaking, it's not the grand opening. It's 10 years from now when the Crosstown neighborhood is revitalized and Crosstown remains active and vibrant. So where are we today? Crosstown opened five years ago. We naively thought that all of the red lights Mayor Orton described in the video had turned green. Crosstown was acclaimed as one of the five best examples of social equity and creative placemaking in the world. It was also recognized as the world's largest LEED Platinum certified historic rehab. But COVID was one heck of an unexpected red light. What happens to a vertical urban village when a worldwide pandemic strikes? What happens when a newly opened theater can no longer be occupied? or when the public art gallery and restaurants can't safely open. The mood changed from energetic optimism to contemplative reflection with the thoughtful question of how do we best help each other? The community made the best of it. Remember, this is a truly mixed use vertical urban village. People live, work, go to school and play all in this magnificent structure. Communities with a shared purpose become closer, even if socially distant. The resiliency of a robust, creative and collaborative community took over. The founding partners drew on their better together commitment and reached out to serve the greater community's needs. Drive-through testing was followed by drive-through vaccinations. Healthcare for the working uninsured never wavered. Takeaway food, Virtual and drive-by performance and visual arts all became normal. Remote education and remote work in an enormous yet intimate 1.5 million square foot civic space created a truly unique social bubble. As the, pan as the pandemic wanes, Crosstown has excelled. Today, Crosstown is 99.8% occupied. Environmentally, it operates 30% more efficiently than the day it opened. With an award-winning project-based teaching model, Crosstown High just graduated its first class. Where there had been a lively debate about what might happen after school as 400 unchaperoned students filled the building, that answer is now clear. The students make Crosstown a much richer environment than ever imagined. They are an integral part of a symbiotic community where the sum is truly greater than the parts. Public artist lectures have returned. Massive community civic events have returned also. Nonprofits have realized that annual banquets and fundraisers can be more powerful when open to the public than in an enclosed event center or a hotel ballroom. The rich community programming ensures there's always something new to discover. As intended, Crosstown is about community. It's where people bring out of town family, where people bring out of town friends. Crosstown is a backdrop for the art of life, a place where all are lovingly embraced. Crosstown is a place of healing where St. Jude patients can feel normal as they recover. Once again, the theater is active with live music, spoken word, and cinema. The green room and art bar provide fabulously intimate venues where artists and audience become one. The Memphis Listening Lab provides the crosstown version of a library, a publicly accessible collection of 40,000 vinyl records 
20,000 CDs, and 1,000 unique pieces of musical history. Resident artists engage the public and routinely collaborate with local artists in the Maker's Lab. Crosstown has become the quintessential parent date night where young kids can run and be themselves and the parents can relax without fear of being judged. Crosstown is where you go to see old friends and meet new ones. What does the future hold? Will Crosstown continue to achieve Todd's vision of creating community and positive change? Yes, absolutely, beyond any shadow of a doubt. Crosstown has spurred an unparalleled citywide optimism it is routinely credited with inspiring more than $2 billion in recently announced downtown redevelopment. We imagined the change would spread like fire through the immediate surroundings, bringing back a vitality that had not been seen since Sears' heyday. It has, and it hasn't. We were unfortunately surprised by absentee building owners who decided that the Crosstown renovation transformed their derelict building into a lottery ticket. The Neighborhood Preservation Act is now being leveraged to encourage change. Crosstown has inspired the adjacent Northside community to infuse an abandoned 300,000 square foot high school with a similar community-based arts, education, health, and wellness program. Northside began construction August of 2022. As icing on the cake, once the historic and new market tax credit sunset, there'll be an intentional process to transfer the Crosstown Concourse ownership structure to a nonprofit model governed by the founding partners. This ensures that the proceeds can be continually reinvested in the mission. I am thankful beyond words that my kids have gotten to grow up in the shadow of Crosstown Concourse, that no matter how hard things get, how challenging life becomes, they recognize we are indeed better together. Thank you. Hello and welcome to your virtual tour of the Universal Life Insurance Building here in Memphis, Tennessee. My name is Matthew White, Marketing Coordinator with Self Tucker Architects, and I'm here with a few members of my team to introduce you to this wonderful project in our amazing city. I'll let them introduce themselves. Hello, my name is Juan Self. I'm one of the founding principals of Self Tucker Architects in Memphis, Tennessee, and also one of the partners of Self Tucker Properties. And together as Self Tucker Architects and Self Tucker Properties, uh, we redeveloped the historic Universal Life Insurance Building. Hello, my name is Mario Walker, and I'm an architect here with Self Tucker Architects, and I was the lead designer on this project. So ready to get into it. Thanks guys. So before we dive into the tour, we just wanna give you a couple lenses to, for the discussion. Um, and these lenses will help to contextualize the story of the building as well as the neighborhood and city that it's in to really help you get an understanding of the importance of this project and its history. So there are three lenses, one being history, one being sustainability, and the last one being legacy. All of these three lenses are important to this project because they highlight how the Universal Life Insurance Building renovation honors the past, protects the planet, and empowers the future. So now, before we dive into the information and into the history, we'll play a quick video that'll introduce you to Memphis and really give you some of that context to help you um, experience this building and this tour properly. Memphis has a different swagger. You know, we have this thing, uh, the Grizzlies use this grit and grind. And it just kind of, that's just the nature of Memphis. You know, we, we just known for getting things done. Pride is also something to add. We're very proud to be Memphians. We're very proud of our history. And even with all the challenges, the one thing about Memphis is we persevere. We never give up. And so this building is a testament to that. You get things like Bill Street, Universal Life, you know, Claiborne Temple, just the, the, the blues of the churches and, and, the, and the religious history here in the city, all those things just kind of culminate to just give Memphis this unique, this unique uh, personality. The era was one that was sort of a, a, a plus and a minus. 
Uh, certainly, it was an era when people were experiencing segregation and, and limited opportunities. In the social norm, it wasn't okay to be black. To be black was to be different. To be black was to be less than. And I just love the fact that Dr. J.E., A. Maceo, everyone who worked at Universal Life made an active choice to refute that because it's not true. Not only was I working here uh, through the relationship of Lemoyne and College and Universal Life Insurance, well, as a kid, we lived in the neighborhood that the owners of this company built and developed, and that was called Walker Homes. I talked to my mom this weekend, and she was like, yeah, you remember we used to walk over to pay our life insurance bills, because we, we were clients of Universal Life. So I remember walking up those steps and going up to that next floor up there and paying that life insurance bill. They had the resources, they had the leadership, um, and they, they made a decision, a very intentional decision of adopting that uh, Egyptian revival style because, again, because of the pride they felt in their accomplishments. It is a passion of mine to watch Memphis become a city that is known for repurposing its historic buildings as opposed to tearing them down. This building in itself stands as part of that reputation. The danger uh, that a building like this was in by the fact that sitting bacon is being cannibalized on a daily basis and so uh, it was important to uh, look at a way in which it could uh, be revived or else it might meet an ultimate demise of being demolished. the city listened to South Tucker when they came with this dream that honestly looked almost impossible. We knew that with a partnership, with investment, and with truly being dedicated that it could happen. And now you look around and here we are. For city government and South Tucker architects to team up to, to repurpose this building for their headquarters and for our efforts to build wealth among MWBEs was a perfect marriage. Developers like Self Tucker, two African American men who have worked and contributed to this community with so much and now to have this project coming forth by their hands and you know by their vision it's something that we're all proud of. We feel that you know we're being role models particularly as architects, as entrepreneurs, as developers for what the possibilities are. Uh, if you have that sustained commitment, if you have the support of the community. As we grow business, create jobs, build wealth, uh, the whole city prospers. We wanted to have really a community of tenants within the building where it became a certain synergy. And the idea is to create an entrepreneurial space that's made for everyone from those with the ideas, those that need support, all of those folks that have lived in this community and created and fostered a reputation for our city that has really sustained us in so many ways. And so now we have this one place, and there I use the word Mecca, where people can come and get support and services. Our focus uh, is around entrepreneurship and creativity, a community of entrepreneurs and creatives. Uh, so that's the way in which the architecture begins to sustain itself uh, for the future and for a new use and a, and a new, new generation. We hope you enjoyed that video as a primer to the Universal Life Insurance Building. Now, we just want to re-highlight some of the important topics that were mentioned. Um, we know we talked a lot about grit and grind, about Memphis's history, about legacy. Um, all of these things are part of what makes Memphis unique and what makes this project unique. Um, Memphis is a city at a turning point where there is a lot of rich history that is setting the groundwork for a lot of revitalization. And this building is part of that because it connects that history um, to Memphis's um, next 200 years, its next future. Um, and so from there, we really are looking at a um, community develop that is developing and a really positive tra trajectory both for the building, both for the neighborhood and for the city. 
Now, the Universal Life Insurance Building is within what we like to call the Memphis Heritage Trail which is an eight-mile um, loop that highlights the contributions of African Americans in the city of Memphis through a collection of markers of historical sites, as well as important buildings that are along the Heritage Trail. Um, now, as you'll see, the Universal Life Insurance Building sits at the uh, northeast corner of that trail um, in its current form and really was part of a mixed income neighborhood that really um, was integral to a lot of the um, civil rights history commerce history and um, economic um, empowerment of this region, both historically and currently today. And so uh, now I'm gonna open it up for Juan and uh, Mario to begin the discussion and start here with the uh, project overview and the discussion of the Universal Life Insurance Building. Thank you, Matt. And uh, as Matt indicated, the Universal Life Insurance Building and really the Universal Life Insurance Company was an integral part of African-American life in Memphis. The company itself started in uh, 1923. And uh, my partner, Jimmy Tucker, and I purchased the building in 2006. We were both the architect and the developer. The building consists of about 33,000 square feet on three floors and a net usable square or net net leasable square footage of about 25,000 square feet. We were fortunate in that the city of Memphis is one of our, is really an anchor tenant. Uh, we also have our offices here, Self Tucker Architects, as well as Self Tucker Properties. And we were able to achieve lead goals. So sustainability is a key factor in the redevelopment of this historic resource. Um, we also uh, allow tours uh, of the building and we have future plans in terms of a green roof as well as a solar canopy. And so really Matt gave you a little bit of the context of this, uh, of this particular site, but in order to really understand the context uh, in terms of how this building is situated, we really have to also look at its history and honor the past. Founded uh, in 1923, the Universal Life Insurance Company uh, grew to be one of the largest African-American owned uh, businesses uh, in the Southeast region. And uh, its uh, reach uh, literally spanned from coast to, to coast, uh, serving several states and several offices and at one point in time having more than 700 employees and of course the headquarters here in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, the founders, J.E. Walker and A.W. Willis, uh, really had a, a vision not only in terms of developing the Universal Life Insurance Company but also a legacy of community uh, engagement and com community redevelopment. Uh, many of their entrepreneurial efforts spread not only from life insurance, but also into banking, uh, as well as uh, community redevelopment, housing, et cetera, and even providing mortgage loans. Dr. Walker, uh, both the founders, uh, J.E. Walker, Joseph E. Walker, as well as A.W. Willis, were uh, both born in Mississippi. And you can see some of the, the milestones in uh, the, the company itself was uh, founded in 1923, Dr. Walker was a graduate of Alcorn A&M at just, uh, at, uh, he was an undergrad at Alcorn A&M at just 16 years old. And the company in 1923 was founded and the building itself opened in 1949. And the architects for the building was uh, McKissick and McKissick out of Nashville, who uh, currently is the oldest um, African-American owned architectural firm in the nation founded in 1905. And Juan, one other important point that we want to mention, of course, um, is really the nature of the um, community involvement that was set out from the beginning and the founding of Universal Life, um, the company. One of the things that they did that was unique to found a company of this size in the Jim Crow South um, was that they funded the uh, initial $100,000 required to open the building by door knocking. They went door to door the same way that you would um, as a salesperson selling insurance to sell shares of the initial uh, run of the building's insurable policy. And so that was how they were able to really innovate 
in a culture where they really weren't able to get necessarily bank loans and that type of thing and get the proper support that would be needed to open up a business of this type and scale in this region. And so that was one, that was another unique aspect of the universal life story. Um, Thank you, Matt. Uh, one of the successors uh, of the Universal Life Insurance Company was A. Maceo Walker. Uh, he was born in 1909 in Indianola, Mississippi, and joined the uh, company in 1923 when he was just 14. And he became president of the Life Universal Life Insurance Company in 1952. And uh, during that 10 year, uh, the Universal Life Insurance Company finances the uh, construction of the J.E. Walker Homes as a multifamily housing development and Walker Homes uh, still exists to this day. The uh, other developments, uh, as I mentioned, they had an entrepreneurial spirit, spirit as well as community development and re revitalization and Universal Life Insurance Company also financed the construction of Elliston Heights Apartments. Um, in 1956, Tri-State Bank uh, had loaned one of the, one of the founding of, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, bank that was founded, Tri-State Bank had loaned more than $10 million in mortgages to over 2,000 families. So uh, the Universal Life Insurance Company and subsequently uh, along with the Tri-State Bank uh, was an integral part of the commerce of the city of Memphis, particularly at the African-American community. And the company had assets that exceeded $9 million. Um, and then those assets grew to up to $50 million. In 1983, uh, as progressive as this company had been all along, uh, Patricia Walker Shaw became president of the, U the Universal Life Insurance Company. Uh, she was born in Little Rock, Arkansas and a graduate of Fisk University. Um, and she served as president of the Universal Life Insurance Company from 1983 until her death in 1985. Uh, a. Maceo Walker then returned as president until his retirement in 1992, in, in 1990 rather. And then in 2002, the Universal Life Insurance Company itself closed. And Juan, part of the legacy of the Universal Life Insurance Company um, really was their impact on individuals as well as communities. Um, part of what they did is that they intentionally uh, bought out other smaller life insurance companies that may have been struggling um, throughout different regions around the United States. And this really led to their exponential growth um, over the years. A. Maceo in particular um, was the longest running president of the organization. And because of that, he spearheaded a lot of that growth um, in addition to um, expanding the Memphis office and growing to that mark of 850 employees at their peak. Um, they also ended up growing into over 11 states that touched both sides of the, both the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean from California all the way up to Virginia, Maryland and Washington DC. Um, so it really is um, an amazing story of growth that from a small company that was founded uh, from door knocking, selling $100 shares of a building um, of a company just to get um, you know, boots on the ground and begin the process of even offering life insurance to becoming the, uh, at their peak, fourth largest African-American owned insurance firm um, in the United States, um, having those huge policy assets and really um, having a community impact both regionally and locally. Um, some of the other things to highlight is that the Universal Life Insurance Company um, started scholarship programs um, throughout uh, the Memphis area and the Mid-South region um, for high schools. And so some of the uh, scholarships that they gave were in the amount of $3,500 up to as high as $5,000. Um, which in those days was really almost a full ride scholarship to some schools, especially um, for a lot of the youth that they interacted with specifically came from uh, low income backgrounds. And so really they were um, committed to making a change on just the economic level and really undergirding the community to help them to grow through housing, through uh, educational opportunity, as well as through providing life insurance, which depending on how you use it, can also grow familial wealth over generations. 
And so that was really one of the most important parts of the legacy um, that Amacio was instilled by his father, J.E., who he instilled in his daughter, uh, Patricia, as well, that really helped the Universal Life Insurance Company to grow. Um, next, we want to really highlight um, the relationship between the McKissick family and the uh, development of this building, because that is really architecturally significant as well, uh, Juan and Mario. I know you guys are excited to talk about that, so we'll move on here. All right. And thank you so much, Matt. Uh, I have the distinction of having um, worked for McKissick and McKissick when I moved to Memphis in 19, uh, 1989. Uh, at that time, uh, Mrs. Leatris, Leatris McKissick uh, was actually the head of the company as her husband, D. Barry, had fallen ill. Um, but the McKissick and McKissick firm was founded in 1905, and uh, they were among the first class of architects period in the state of Tennessee to be licensed. Um, and so, and, and this firm actually continues to this day and the uh, granddaughters of the founders are, um, are running the company uh, at this time, or actually even the, um, uh, yes, the granddaughters are, are running that, uh, Cheryl and Daryl McKissick, and they, there are offices uh, throughout the United States as well. But Moses and Calvin uh, McKissick were the, the two founders, and Calvin was instrumental in the design as well as the construction of the Universal Life Insurance Building. The first home uh, was on Hernando Street. Uh, that particular building was demolished uh, ultimately, and then uh, in 1947, there was a groundbreaking for the building that we are uh, speaking to you about today. Uh, that legacy continues unto this day, um, and you can see some of the photos of the grand opening when the building opened in 1949. We were fortunate uh, in, in redeveloping the building. We had a celebration of, uh, for the 70, 70th year of the building's opening in, in 2019. And we were fortunate in that there were uh, many of the uh, uh, former employees of the Universal Life Insurance Company had an opportunity to come and see the building revitalized. Thank you, Juan. Um, so really that sets the stage for a lot of the history of the Universal Life Insurance Company. Um, really a community oriented organization and company that was focused on the bettering of society, both economically, um, culturally, educationally, and really set the groundwork for a lot of excellent things in the region and in the country. Um, but also tying back that back to the building, and this historic building where so much of this vital work happened. We also want to talk about how now in the revitalized building, um, these efforts are not being forgotten, but they're being honored and they're being continued through the ongoing work of Self Tucker Properties um, and the companies that work within the building. Um, particularly, first we want to talk about how this renovation protects the planet. Thank you, Matt. And uh, Mario and I will piggyback on this. Uh, when my partner, Jimmy Tucker, and I purchased the building in 2006, uh, we were really proud and still are that it is in the heart of the city, in the zip code 38126, the area that we call South Memphis. And uh, we were one of the first to, do re uh, to redevelop in this area. And we are pleased that we see development happening all around uh, this particular building. Uh, we were able to restore the historic sign, and that was actually done by the company that actually created the original sign. Uh, it had become an iconic marker in the city of Memphis, and even as uh, once we purchased it and began the redevelopment, uh, we received many inquiries, will you be able to uh, save the sign? And we were fortunate to be able to have that sign restored. Uh, we have a, we have a team of designers, architects, engineers, et cetera, that worked uh, together along with our contractor in this redevelopment. Uh, we were so pleased in 2000, uh, after the purchase of the building in 2006, we had it listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 2007. Unfortunately, uh, by the time we put together our plans and we're ready to begin to uh, look for financing. Uh, the real estate market crashed in 2008. And so our dream was certainly deferred, but uh, ultimately in 2018, we were able to enter this revitalized historic resource, the Universal Life Insurance Building. 
Thank you, Juan. And can you talk a little bit about um, the funding strategy for how you made this happen? I know that this was a really um, a labor of love, but it was a labor in itself to really be creative and strategic in the ways in which you guys developed the capital stack and, and really were able to make this project a, a reality. Yes, thank you, Matt. And um, definitely uh, a source of mixed financing. Um, in 2015, we were able to secure uh, an allocation of, uh, of qualified energy conservation bonds. And so that really became the catalyst for uh, the rest of the funding. We were also able to secure historic tax credits and we, and as well as an infrastructure grant uh, from the city of Memphis. Um, and so, uh, and that along with uh, a pilot uh, payment in lieu of taxes, as well as a low interest, a very low interest uh, facade restoration loan from the downtown Memphis commission and then ultimately a, a commercial loan. And so um, it, it definitely was a, a journey uh, and mixed finance. And uh, it took a lot of work and a lot of coordination to, uh, to secure these funds, but uh, the capital stack is, is not a traditional uh, development uh, in terms of the financing, but we were able to put together several different sources of funds to make the project happen, of course. Uh, and that also in addition to the equity that we have in the property as well. Thank you, Juan. Um, now, I also want to make sure that we highlight um, some of the efforts that were put together in terms of uh, preserving parts of the building and keeping some of that embodied image, uh, embodied energy, excuse me, as Mario likes to say. <laughs> um, so let's uh, go through here and kind of look at how some of the space has changed um, from pre-vitalization um, through the uh, end of construction. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, Pre-renovation -pre for this project, as you can imagine, a building built in 1949, there were a lot of um, hazardous materials and um, elements that were damaged over time that needed to be repaired also and removed from the building um, to make way for the new work. So these images show some of the typical damage, which included, um, uh, you know, missing ceilings, um, damage and outdated uh, electrical MEP services, uh, damaged windows, as well as broken windows and uh, rusted uh, frames. Also, uh, lots of asbestos, which we had to remediate as well as lead paint um, were throughout the entire project. And um, we were able to remediate all of those um, hazardous materials to make way for all the new work. Um, the next slide shows the um, layout of the original floor plan. So we're going to go from the basement up. So we, the project is, uh, I believe, one is 30,000 square feet each floor, 32,000 square feet each floor. Well, it's the, the, the built. The total is thirty-three thousand and roughly eleven thousand square feet per floor. floor. Thank you, sir. Um, so, um, starting here at the ground floor, um, the original plan uh, housed all of its services and activity zones for the workers of the building. Um, to the southernmost portion, that larger volume um, were training rooms, uh, an activity room for the staff, as well as a full-service cafe and kitchen. Um, also um, on this floor, all your services, your boiler room, mail room, that sort of thing. And um, moving into the new phase of construction, a lot of that, those spaces or the, the uh, atmosphere and feel of those spaces were retained. So um, the tenant, uh, the city of Memphis occupies about 50% of that lower level. Um, and they currently use it as it was originally used as training spaces and uh, multi-purpose spaces for the um, City of Memphis Office of Business Development Center. And so um, really being inspired by the use of that space um, became the was the influence for how this space was ultimately um, renovated and uh, redesigned. And so there's also um, the previous slide showed an area for a future cafe. We're actually talking with the current uh, uh, potential tenant to actually bring a cafe to repopulate the area where the original cafeteria occupied. 
Um, moving forward in the next slide, we can see the second, the first floor, excuse me, the main floor, which is um, right off of the main entrance that you see to the south, which is the um, to the left on this screen. Um, that would have been the main entrance lobby. And on this floor were various services that the community could utilize, which goes from um, the computer storage mainframe to records department to um, the claims department. So um, these were all the workers um, facilitated those tasks from. And from the renovated portion of the plan, we can see that the city occupies most of that space. So um, to the, what would be the west, which is the top of this diagram, are this uh, city um, offices. And to the west, which is the bottom of this diagram, um, would be the business development center where um, locals can come in uh, and actually start their businesses out in this space. As their businesses grow, they can move out into uh, the marketplace from here. Um, and there are other areas around the, on this floor, excuse me, that are currently for lease. So we're actually in the process of building out those spaces, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And one other additional element that we've incorporated on this floor plan, um, the cyan area of the floor plan is a, an exhibit space that kind of retails the story and celebrates the story of this um, historic building. You can go to the next slide. So um, these images show the um, Entrepreneurs Network Center, uh, which is an open office concept. And restoring those windows actually brings a lot of light into this space. We, that's something that we really wanted to capitalize on was the amount of windows and the amount of natural light that floods um, these interior spaces. And the image to the right shows the private office space of the city space that the city occupies, which is on that um, southwest corner. Here, and I'll ask uh, Matt to elaborate a little bit on the um, MTSU involvement. Um, this is our historic gallery that's currently on the first floor, just um, to the right of the ent main entrance. And like I said before, it uh, really highlights the, um, the history of this place, of this building, and the impact it had on its community. And um, this was commissioned, excuse me, by um, the MTSU Center of Historic Preservation that we partnered with. And they actually um, uh, employ team tour guides to um, bring patrons into the building and um, educate the public on the history of this building. Uh, Matt, do you have anything to add to that? I know you were entering into that. Sure, absolutely, Mario. So this space actually has a special place in my heart, but also um, one of the things we wanna make sure that we highlight um, is, yes, definitely that relationship between uh, MTSU Center for Historic Preservation um, and our design team. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we intentionally mm -hmm. took some time to develop a detailed resource report regarding the building, its history, the, con the company, and its impact locally, regionally, and nationally, um, and really find a way to tell all of that story in a concise manner. And so what we did is we dedicated um, a specific amount of space here in this public facing part of the building um, where anyone who visits the Universal Life Insurance Building can immediately walk in and be inundated with a rich history of the building and then experience not only through the services that the building provides its legacy, um, but also see its history and see where, how that tone was set for this space that we like to call um, a building that sets a space for creatives and entrepreneurs. Um, as you can see in the image on the right, we do have two teen docents. This image is actually from um, the grand opening in 2019. Um, and so then what we did is we actually developed a tour route that goes throughout the entirety of the building where you can uh, experience in a detailed manner um, the history of the building, the history of the company, their impact, and some of the things we've talked about so far and get that history hands-on. You can see some of the elements we preserved in terms of um, some of the glass lights in the doors, some of the um, reproductions of some materials. You can experience a lot of the materiality of the space as it was in 1949, but then also get the history of who was in that office. How did they, um, what did they do for the company? How did they make an impact? And so that's really part of um, 
what we wanted to highlight and talk about in the history. And so you'll see uh, once again is in the image to the uh, left actually, the historic uh, boards that were made that tell that history. And so part of the future planning um, that is ongoing now is to also add um, some display cases that showcase some of the um, objects that were found in the building as well. We actually have a wealth of hundreds of historic photos um, detailing the history of the building from the 1940s on up through as late as the uh, mid to late 90s. And so that's something that we are uh, working on now to further tell that story and have some of those photo books, some of the marketing materials that are as old as the 1950s um, and showcase some of those objects as well within this space. And so that was part of the intentional nature of how we went about designing this project to not only reuse and adaptively reuse that space, but even more so leverage that history and keep that legacy identified and keep that top of mind as our key design inspiration uh, for how we determine the uses for the building in the different spaces. And one, one other important aspect of that, uh, Matt, in terms of the history and telling the story is uh, we recorded oral histories from uh, persons who either worked at the building or had close relationships with the uh, Universal Life Insurance Company. And we'll ultimately have those available for uh, the public to view as well. Thank you, Juan and Matt. That's some great information. Um, we really wanted to celebrate the interior spaces and showcase the history of this space um, and its materials that we use throughout the space. Um, really wanted to expound upon and celebrate the natural light that comes into the building, um, putting or putting back into play the original layouts of the floor plan, which showcased these open spaces, as well as allowed that natural light to flood these interior spaces. Um, also preserving and maintaining the original um, design elements such as the marble wainscoting and terrazzo floors were very important um, to save and make sure it was a major feature within these interior spaces. Next slide, please. Thank you, Mario. So here we move to the second floor which um, housed the largest open space with the clerical offices, as you can see in this image, historic image. Um, the Seth Tucker offices currently occupy that space. And also on that floor, um, in the thinner bar of that di original diagram, were all of the executive offices, including the offices of A.C. Maceo and uh, Dr. Walker. Um, a lot of those spaces are still retained to this day. Uh, currently, the uh, executive office spaces are shell space and are slated for um, redevelopment in, our, in phase three of our project, which would include um, adding more uh, office space and uh, a work share area for um, those small businesses. Um, especially those coming out of the, the city's um, business development program could utilize that space as they start their businesses um, moving into the market. Uh, for the Seth Tucker space, uh, we really work within the historic boundaries of that space. Um, that space featured a large um, barrel vault wood ceiling with steel trusses, which we have preserved. Um, and all of the natural light and um, uh, 12 foot tall windows were all preserved in this space as well. Um, and we were very, uh, coming from a, our original office, which was very dark, only had one window. We now have 15 <laughs> that we're continuing with every day. And it's, uh, it's been uh, very great to have this amount of light in this space. It really opens up the space and make it feel fresh. Um, the windows were able to be restored um, these are all the original windows that we were able to salvage and, um, they were all reglazed with one inch insulated glass and, um, none of the windows, um, uh, are operable. So they all lost their operable nature, but we are, were able to retain, um, like I said, the original windows and all that natural light. Um, the original space featured a ceiling a hard ceiling, which was about um, 14 feet tall uh, above the finished floor. And so um, 
uh, requirements for um, SHPO and the, the preservation and compliance for that. Uh, we had to restore part of that um, ceiling feature, um, but we were able to keep um, the barrel vault exposed in key areas of our layout of our floor plan for this space. Um, and that space would be our, our main entrance as well as our uh, loft space above our entry volume. And I think that also allows the building of Mario and Matt to not only come alive, but also the building itself becomes an interpretive element so that uh, it's visible in terms of the, the method of construction as well as honoring uh, the original layouts and ceiling heights, et cetera. Absolutely. We definitely want to share that, um, all of the aspects of this building that make it special. Also, a major move that we decided to take was to incorporate contemporary office design into this historic shell. Um, it was strategically done that way so we can have a um, we can view the future and what the space could be used for, but also have a sense of where it came from. Um, and having those two just opposed to each other was very important in the design process. Also on this floor are some major elements that we decided to retain or were able to retain, I, I would say. Uh, we preserved a lot of the historic uh, original interior doors along the main historic corridor. Uh, a lot of those were refurbished um, and the hardware updated. Uh, we were able to keep and restore some of the gold leaf painted glass lights that are throughout the entire project. And um, we were also able to retain and restore the um, historic cashier's window uh, where a lot of um, patrons and visitors who visited this uh, building went to pay their insurance policies. So that's the main feature in one of our lobby spaces on the second floor. And we also were able to re uh, retain a lot of the, some more of the, a lot of the historic details, excuse me, uh, such as the um, historic handrails, which are all uh, cast aluminum, uh, which are major elements within the space. So moving to the outside of the building, um, these are some historic photos showing um, just the makeup and character of the building. It is an Egyptian revival style. Um, the west and southern faces of the building are clad in limestone and the west and excuse me, the east and northern are uh, a brick masonry. So a lot of the repairs and um, uh, refresh of the exterior was re, um, point tucking and um, refinishing and resurfacing a lot of these elements. Um, as you can see on the corner there in this image, the very corner of the building, we had to do some um, minor restoration to the building's um, limestone facade, um, but we were able to get the facade um, pretty much watertight. <laughs> and so um, uh, other elements that were added since the restoration, um, some uh, uh, transportation elements, which include uh, historic markers from, that are a part of the Memphis Heritage Trail. Uh, these markers go throughout the entire trail and they give a lot, um, they give detailed history and historic information to those who are passing by or pedestrians. Um, also some changes to the site or around this property were some street up, upgrades, uh, which include bike lanes, bike lanes as well as um, decorative planters um, and crosswalks, which weren't there before. Um, also a part of that, um, all of these elements including the restoration of the historic sign as one I mentioned before, all of that plays into the public and sustainable transit um, that's um, available to this site. This slide showcases the Egyptian revival elements that were saved um, on this project. The main columns that are at the two main entrances into the building are of uh, papaya stalk, a uh, bound papaya stock, which you really find a lot of in Egyptian revival architecture. Um, once again, mentioning we were able to um, retain and 
um, bring up to code the existing iron windows or steel windows with new insulated glass. Uh, as mentioned before as well, the restoration to the clock, um, the historic um, uh, state's historic marker is still in place and was refurbished as well, as well as the addition of the uh, Memphis Heritage Trail marker. And Mario, one thing I want to also highlight that um, you brought to my attention was also the intentionality behind the Egyptian revival style choice of the building. That was very intentional that the McKissicks chose to do that. Um, this is an interesting point of history is that originally um, the Universal Life Insurance Company was considering purchasing a neoclassically designed church that is just up the block, just out of um, sight. If, they, if you look at that image at the bottom mm -hmm. uh, right, that red brick building in the background actually has a, a limestone facade that is neoclassical in nature. And they were considering purchasing that building uh, from a church that was leaving the area due to white flight. But they intentionally chose to uh, select this site at this prominent corner of the community that was surrounded by a mixture of housing as well as um, stores and storefronts. And they chose the Egyptian revival style specifically. And this was in some of the writings that I had seen uh, done by uh, Dr. J.E. In, in conversation with the McKissick specifically because they wanted to highlight the greatness of Africa and of um, a well-known um, uh, black um, civilization that had a huge indelible impact on culture, on society, on on media, on all these different aspects. And they wanted to highlight that and reflect that greatness in their building here. And that it, this also ties into the interesting point of Memphis, Tennessee being named after Memphis, a uh, ancient historic capital of Egypt along the mm -hmm. River Nile and the parallel between that and the Mississippi River. And so it really was just this multi-layered uh, design decision, both of the McKissicks and of Self Tucker Architects, to highlight those elements in those ways. And so that that's just an interesting point of the history I thought was important to mention here about the Egyptian Revival style and why it was selected by the McKissicks and the Walker family for this building. You're absolutely correct. And like I said, this these elements and this style was something that we definitely wanted to celebrate um, and retain and make sure it, it lasted for years to come in this community. One, one thing that we also want to mention is really some of the outcomes that came from our strategic preservation of the exterior, our preservation of um, a lot of the interior elements and key spaces that really made up the architectural character of the building. Um, these resulted in some um, awards and some design awards as well as some impact awards. Um, the first one particularly being the 2021 impact awards, that is tied directly to the sustainable nature of the building, which we're going to talk about in just a moment. Um, the building is actually LEED Gold certified and we'll get into that in just a moment. But um, that was an important reason why uh, we were able to win that award is because of the impact of the building, both on uh, the environment and the protection of that, but in addition to that, the impact on the community as well. That was really an important note that the judges mentioned was the impact of the building on uh, entrepreneurship and honoring that legacy that we've talked about throughout this presentation. Um, but we won several other awards and the building uh, really is deserving, of, was really deserving of those awards because of the degree to which the history was both maintained architecturally, but also highlighted through the building programming that we've talked about previously um, in part um, due to the historic gallery, um, to through some of the programs that parallel some of the programs that were done by the Universal Life Insurance Company. And so that's part of what we wanted to highlight here was how those, M, how those uh, outcomes tie in to the mission that, that was driving this project overall. As, as Matt mentioned, uh, the building was certified LEED Gold. Um, and so we are uh, not only pleased with that certification, as Matt mentioned, but sustainability is really a core uh, value of our practice overall as architects and as citizens. Um, and some of the things that we actually have implemented within the building, uh, recycling and uh, use of uh, various elements, low flow water fixtures, high efficiency, uh, heating and air conditioning, et cetera. We also wanted to highlight those elements within the building itself. So again, the building itself becomes an interpretive element so that it's visible with respect to those sustainable elements, the windows, the ductwork, the uh, HVAC equipment, et cetera. Um, 
and we recently implemented uh, in, install uh, signage uh, to add further interpretive elements to those key sustainable elements. And so um, we not only did that with respect to lead, but also it was uh, in, with respect to our values and lead, but also it ties directly into the qualified energy conservation bond. So uh, we, we were already moving in that direction. And so uh, we also have future plans for a, a 50 kW solar parking canopy. We have the in infrastructure uh, in terms of the first phase already uh, installed. We also have infrastructure for um, uh, bat uh, charging stations for uh, electric vehicles. And so uh, we are really uh, excited about the future of this building from a sustainability standpoint. Absolutely. And in addition to that, there are plans for a roof garden. We actually, or a rooftop terrace, um, and uh, vegetated roof, and we actually have put in the infrastructure, uh, new staircase and elevator access to this level of the building um, to really capitalize on one rainwater collection and um, also cool roof um, strategy. So um, we're hoping, hopeful that this would um, be something that could be started in the near future and well as become a major uh, amenity to this site. Yeah. Additionally, uh, when it comes to sustainability, many times historic preservation and sustainability are not uh, used in the same sentence, but we believe it's a perfect marriage because first of all, there is an embodied energy within every building. And so we believe that renovating an existing resource is one of the most sustainable things we can do for our planet. And so all of the energy and all of the carbon that was taken and embodied within this structure, we were able to preserve uh, a, a large percentage of that as we redevelop the, uh, the Universal Life Insurance uh, building. Thanks, Juan. And one thing, another element of the uh, sustainability of the Universal Life Insurance building is that it went beyond just the practice of in the design portion and as we're doing the commissioning, making sure that the materials are sustainable and the systems are sustainable, but also making sure that we find ways to make sure that um, the people within the building are utilizing the building in sustainable ways. Part of that went to a building-wide recycling process um, and waste infrastructure. Um, and so we also have a clean greening program and plan that we have enacted that allows us to keep the building clean from top to bottom in ways that uh, eliminate uh, odors, VOCs, and other volatile chemicals that might impact the health of the people that live, that work in the building and that come to visit the building and learn about that history as well as utilize some of the services and functions. And so within the first uh, few quarters of operation, we were able to uh, divert um, nearly a half, over half a ton of electronic material and waste um, from landfill and send that to an organization that works to refurbish those materials and um, give them to people in need and sell those to people in need and other businesses and small businesses throughout the region. Um, so that was part of the intentional partnerships that we made in creating a uh, pipeline um, for sustainability that began with the project inception but goes on beyond that as the project begins to fully operate and as people come online and begin to lease the spaces, there will be an intentional upkeep that continues that sustainability for decades and generations to come of people who use the building. Thank you, Matt. And, and with that as well, the lease requirements, the leasehold requirements also include uh, an agreement by uh, current tenants as well as future tenants to uh, uh, in, uh, to incorporate these sustainable practices as they engage and are using the uh, using the building. So Mario mentioned transportation. Transportation is key. Uh, one of the things we noticed since uh, the building is open is that there's a, a marked increase of pedestrian traffic, and that has to do with some of the development that's happening around the Universal Life Insurance Building. But it's also uh, in part due to more friendly streets, a more friendly streetscape, uh, bicycle lanes, et cetera. And so making it easy for pedestrians to engage. Uh, we also are, are 
are on a major route in terms of the uh, ingress and egress from the downtown portion of Memphis. And there are also uh, bus routes directly tied and uh, anchored here at the Universal Life Insurance Building. And so with that, uh, uh, public transportation, mass transportation, as well as pedestrian and biking is a, an integral part of this particular development and also con uh, provides connectivity to many of the major bike and uh, pedestrian paths in the city of Memphis. So part of the strategy that we developed to create lasting change were to go into these three lanes that almost line up with the three lenses with which we looked at this project from the design phase, but entrepreneurship being one, cultural heritage tourism being the second, and community revitalization being the third. And no, and this isn't a hierarchy, none of these are more important than the other, but they were all um, really kind of a triumvirate that we used to look at the project from these three ways of how we wanted to holistically design the uses for the project. So that first heading of entrepreneurship, one of the ways in which we intentionally looked at uh, um, developing that a spirit of entrepreneurship within the building was to first of all, um, take charge of that by ourselves by becoming the first tenant of the building. self Tech Architects moved our office into this building intentionally to be hands-on with that approach. We also moved the development arm of self Tech Architects, uh, self Tech Properties into the building, which led the development here um, to be able to further be um, hands-on with the community, with the project itself, and really take the lead on that and set and trailblaze in that way. Um, we also had a pretty innovative partnership with the city of Memphis, um, and they actually uh, were willing to move their Office of Business Diversity and Compliance into the uh, first floor of this building, as well as um, uh, we made sure to highlight and retain spaces within the building and intentionally um, uh, keep that lease space and earmark it for small businesses that may be using some of the services that the Office of Business Diversity and Compliance um, provides to create a pipeline of coming from a um, new business owner or a small business. Maybe you're at home using a remote, doing a remote business and you're ready to move to that next stage of brick and mortar. You may need office space or you may just need support and training that allows you to take that next step and go full time in your business. That was one of the ways in which we intentionally leveraged entrepreneurship. So the second uh, way of the three ways that we leveraged uh, the way, the mission of this project is cultural heritage tourism. We specifically wanted to make sure that we highlighted that history that we've talked so much about in this presentation, uh, but really tie it into um, other efforts within the community to highlight the neighborhood's um, history that ties in directly to the Memphis Heritage Trail and some of the other buildings and structures and uh, key points in Memphis's history that tie into universal life um, that impacted each other in a real beautiful and cyclical way. And so as we highlight that history, we're uh, furthering uh, the history of the neighborhood itself. We also wanted to make sure that we do that in the building campus itself um, through the uh, historic exhibit and through that historic tour um, and create engagement for future generations. Um, we, we spoke about it previously, but the Universal Life Insurance Company uh, spent a lot of time being intentional in their community outreach to have uh, students come into the space. They would shadow professionals within the building and find out about different career paths and things that they may not have even known about as career options and opportunities uh, for them, especially in the Jim Crow South, as we mentioned. Um, and so that was really important to um, kind of make a parallel to that and really be intentional about engaging with students in the modern day uh, Memphis through educational experiences, being able to come and be mentored and shadow architects within our office both uh, young architects and seasoned professionals, um, and then also uh, create opportunities for entrepreneurship for these young people um, through um, the ability to work as a docent or as a tour guide in the building. So those are paid opportunities to not only learn about the history, but apply what you've learned in there to other, to. Um, to not only learn about the history, but apply what you've learned and empower others, whether they be classmates or whether they be visitors to the building. And so really creating ways in which these things uh, kind of connect and, and click in with each other to really holistically uh, bring about that project mission to create a, a, a place for creatives and entrepreneurs. And then lastly, um, and Juan may want to uh, tap in more on this since we do have some more slides on that coming up, but about community revitalization as well. So part of the context, and, and Juan highlighted at it or hinted at it earlier um, with the building and with uh, 
you know, the recession of 2007 and 2008, how that impacted not just this project, but um, locally in the neighborhood, several other projects that were around. Um, this building was before we revitalized, it was uh, very much blighted, but also so there were other blighted properties and um, just opportunities for infill at this prominent corner that really is at two of Memphis's biggest and most well-traveled streets. But um, not only as developers for this building, but also uh, furthering our developer acumen by building um, multifamily housing on this same block as this building to create even further and grow that pipeline that's from entrepreneurs to small business owners to people that maybe even now live and work on the same block or in the same region. So really trying to uh, fight the blight, not only in this corner, but grow the economics of the area, the same way that Universal Life Insurance Company was intentional about building this building here and doing life and working and revitalizing this community. We're mirroring that in our company's ethos and in their intentional uh, work as well. Thank you, Matt. Also, and as you go to the next uh, couple of si slides, uh, from an entrepreneur standpoint and community revitalization standpoint, uh, there are so many parallels with the with respect to the founders of the Universal Life Insurance Company and our organization, Self Tucker Architects and Self Tucker Properties, having similar visions to provide opportunities for entrepreneurs to not only begin but also to grow. Partnering partnering with the city and other uh, businesses, both major corporations as well as uh, smaller private businesses, uh, really providing uh, uh, helping to uh, provide opportunities and plant the seeds of entrepreneurship, not only to those who uh, we come in contact with, but also within our own organization uh, to have an entrepreneurial outlook on all of the work that we do and also have a community revitalization and community empowerment uh, 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 site or lens on all the projects that we work on. And so uh, we're pleased to really have uh, just even uh, to be able to touch and move forward and advance uh, the legacy of the founders of the Universal Life Insurance Company. Uh, the cultural heritage tourism, uh, along with redevelopment in terms of the community, uh, just uh, within this, this uh, less than a half mile radius, projects such as the revitalization of the uh, historic Claiborne Temple, uh, just uh, two blocks uh, from here, the revital revitalization of the Griggs Business College, and then uh, re, uh, a project that's completed, uh, at least partially in terms of first phase, the uh, NAACP building locally, and then uh, and, and so uh, it's really a hub of activity and so much that's happening around the Universal Life Insurance Building that are really offshoots as uh, we planted our flag here and uh, we can really see just around us the history and the heritage from the Heritage Trail and so many other cultural assets. Uh, and then even the spirit uh, being ignited to uh, for preservation of these historical assets. Uh, you can see uh, my partner, Jimmy uh, Tucker and all, uh, interviewing uh, former uh, employees, uh, staff persons of the Universal Life Insurance Company, who also went on to be great entrepreneurs themselves. Uh, recording that oral history was an important aspect in terms of preserving this legacy and moving it forward. Thanks, Juan. Um, so looking at some future improvements to the Universal Life Insurance Building campus, um, as mentioned before, we are in the process of installing a 50KW solar carport with EV charging stations, as well as the plan um, green roof and terrace um, on atop of the original building. But we're also looking at um, other development on the property. We currently own the entire block that the building sits on, and we are looking at developing some um, market rate um, apartments, one bedroom apartments. Um, these will be uh, highly sustainable as well. We're really looking at pursuing um, lead for this project as well. Um, some sustainable features that are being explored are photovoltaic panels, uh, water rainwater harvesting, as well as water reduction, um, potential um, geothermal energy uh, in a horizontal loop because Memphis is on the aquifer, so we are limited to how deep we, we can uh, have those loops. Um, and then native um, 
planting and arrangements, also maximizing uh, views and uh, open space as well as um, uh, natural light, access to natural light and fresh air and ventilation. So uh, this is, we've dubbed this project the 510 MLK project, which will feature uh, nearly 40 um, units, um, I believe 20 to 30 one bedroom units and a, um, a around 15 to 20 uh, studio apartments. Uh, as mentioned before, there'll be market rate and um, the design of this building was directly influenced um, by the uh, Universal Life Insurance Building and take some of those cues, but rearrange them um, in scale and in rhythm. Well, mm -hmm. it mimics the building in scale and rhythm, but takes those, those cues and um, shifts them into a more contemporary um, language. So um, we're really excited about this project and looking forward to um, the next phase of it. All right, so I do want to take an opportunity, first of all, to thank Matt and Mario, uh, as well as uh, the National Trust and the Pass Forward Conference for the opportunity to just tell you a little bit about the Universal Life Insurance Building. Also I want to thank my partner, Jimmy Tucker, and the entire Self Tucker Architects and Self Tucker Properties team. Uh, there were certainly many challenges and roadblocks along the way. One of the greatest challenges was time and money, of course. Uh, the uh, Great Recession uh, that uh, we were uh, we were uh, that we had to go through uh, during the development phase of it, but ultimately we believe we have a better project for all of the various uh, speed bumps and roadblocks that we encountered, and so this this facility has become really a beacon, uh, almost like a beacon of hope for this community. Again, we are planted. Uh, in the center or, or, or within the 38126 zip code, South Memphis, uh, a community that has historically been uh, under-resourced. Uh, and we believe that uh, the redevelopment of the United of the Universal Life Insurance Building has been a catalyst for redevelopment around this area.